It's my great pleasure on today for Physio Plus 10 to be having the chance to talk to Mary McGarry. Um, Mary, thank you for joining us. And I always like to start these podcasts by asking the participant why it is they decided to do physio, but you've actually got a bit of a different story, haven't you? Uh, yes, Doug, I do. I certainly didn't get into physio because of a passion for sport or for anything in particular. My, I wanted to be a vet, absolutely wanted to be a vet. And at that time, to do vet science, you had to go interstate and my parents weren't interested in my going interstate. Um, <clears throat> so my next choice was medicine. And my father, who was a doctor, made the comment that he didn't think I had the marks to get into medicine. And so then my mum said, um, why don't you do physio? It's such a nice thing for a girl to do. You can continue to work when you've got married and after you've had babies. Well, that wasn't a particularly attractive reason to go into physio, but my mother was fairly persuasive. Um, and so with some reluctance, I switched my priorities from medicine one, physio two to the other way around. Um, so yes, that's how I got into physio. Now, just in, in like in a time scale, is, is this still a time when f females were considered appropriate for teaching and nursing or have we moved out of that era and things are a little bit more broader? There was no real um, perception, I don't think, of the not being something that I should be able to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I think my dad, my father genuinely thought that my results weren't good enough. As it turns out, they would have been, but I'm glad actually in hindsight that he made Fair that luck, decision. <laughs> um, I, I now live my veterinary aspirations vicariously through my daughter, who's a vet. So, right. Um, yeah, it's any, except for the issue about traveling interstate, the options were, were open. Yeah. And so were your, were your parents in the health sphere like already, or is this something new for the family? No, no, my father was a doctor. He was um, a surgeon, a general surgeon, and had been president of the AMA. Well, he hadn't at that stage, that came later, uh, national president, and um, uh, was an examiner for the College of Surgeons. And he okay. was actually invited services to medicine and medical education. So he had been, yes, he was very much a doctor. And my brother has just retired as a GP and I have a cousin who's a GP as well. So Wow, so very strong medical. And my grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather was a gynecologist. He was actually the very first doctor with the Norwood Football Club in a SANFL. I'm not quite sure how a gynecologist works there, but maybe they didn't specialise <laughs> quite so much. I wasn't going to ask then. that question. <laughs> <laughs> so like, just in hindsight then, are there regrets that you didn't follow the family tradition and go into medicine proper? No, no. Um, in fact, I'm very pleased that I ended up in physio. While I didn't think so at the time, I definitely think so now. No, no question about it. And why is that? Why are you so um, confident about that answer? Um, I guess it's that's not a question that you have previously thought to ask me. Um, Ad -lib. I think it's because um, of the strength of clinical reasoning that came through very strongly within physiotherapy, certainly in the physiotherapy education that I had and that I have continued to be involved with. And I, I, without meaning to be disrespectful to the medical profession, the experience that I've had is that they often don't have that same approach to reasoning. They don't think things through as broadly as we are required to do. And I find when dealing with doctors in that, in that situation, that that can be really frustrating, that they're sort of almost tunnel visioned. Um, and that can be really destructive for a patient sometimes and frustrating to work with for us. So, yeah, no, I, I was interested. I know I didn't ask that question to <laughs> put you on the spot, but I just had suddenly thought that that's probably something that's important for younger physios to consider because often they, say, they aspire to physio and they think, oh, this is not enough. I want to go and do medicine. It's almost like, medicine is higher in the perspective of, I don't know, in their mind as being more important. But if someone had asked me that question, I would have said, well, I like the independence of being a physio 
and I like the process of clinical reasoning. And generally, the patients that we see are we're dealing in shades of grey. So it's not black. Medicine seems to be more black and white. Yes and no. You got this or you haven't got that. Whereas I was even just seeing you through patients that I saw today, and I had a student watching me, and I sort of thought this is difficult because there's not a very you know, we deal with a lot of syndromes like <laughs> we don't have a, a specific test that we can say this is the problem and therefore this is the treatment it's often an mm. aggregation of symptoms which we have to sort of filter through and prioritize and then say okay based upon that process as you say clinical reasoning this is how we're going to approach it. Does that sound okay to you? And so it's really a two way street. Once we've got that information, we process and we give it back to the patient. And I was kind of interested in your take on how you felt about medicine and physio in regards to, I guess, their relative merit, so to speak. Well, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, in some ways, I think that we will always be considered um, a somewhat lower in the picking order. But, uh, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I think I'm being a bit unfair to some branches of medicine, but uh, I mean, I'll use an example of a patient I saw last week for this. She was, she actually came to me having already seen two physios. She had been to an orthopedic surgeon who'd sent her to a neurosurgeon who sent her back to the orthopedic surgeon who sent her back to the neurosurgeon. She'd had three lots of injections. Um, one in a neck, one in a scapula, I'm not quite sure where, and one in a shoulder, none of which had done any good. And they, you know, they were all, the, the neurosurgeon was saying, no, this is an orthopedic problem. The orthopedic surgeon was saying, no, this is a neurologic problem. It turned out she had a frozen shoulder mm. and nobody had actually physically examined her or listened to the clinical pattern to recognize that that's what it sounded like. And that's, that's one of the things that I think is is so valuable about physio is that we are able to to look at that big picture um, put it all together I mean this woman was beside herself with anxiety and and um, stress because of this whole range of doctor shopping and physio shopping yeah. and nobody just sitting down yeah. and saying listen I think this is what's going on I can't be certain but that's what I think is happening here are the reasons why here's some information about it here's something we may be able to do to help effectively showing her some pain relieving things that she could do for herself yeah. at the time yeah so you know it's that it's that narrowness of some of the specialties that makes it frustrating very siloed Anyway, we better get back on task because that was interesting, but uh, we uh, drifted a little bit. So coming okay. back to early stages of your career, where did you study physio and when did you complete that qualification? Um, I studied physio at the South Australian Institute of Technology, Institute of Technology in Adelaide. Um, it was the only place in South Australia where you could study physio at the time. And given that my parents didn't want me to travel interstate, and physio wasn't really what I wanted to do anyway. Um, there wasn't any option to do it anywhere else. Right. Um, I know right. when you spoke to Pat Trott recently, she pointed out that going from the University of Adelaide to the Institute was a huge bonus for the physio, um, uh, physio school. And I remember hearing that at the time. But when I first started, it absolutely wasn't for me because I was... I had just met all these exciting people at Adelaide Uni and I wanted to be down there on their campus with them and not stuck in the physiotherapy school where we were, it was much more structured, much more um, uh, disciplined approach than a lot of the people I had just met going so into Adelaide you, So Uni. you transitioned from Uni of South Australia to South Australian Institute? No, the university, sorry, the, un, the physio degree transferred from Adelaide Uni where it was an associate of the University of Adelaide qualification to the South Australian Institute of Technology, where we got a diploma in technology in the first three or four years. And after that, it became a, um, a Bachelor of Physiotherapy. Okay. So did you start at one and then transfer to the other? Like between no, I, I, was, I, was, I was in the first year at the, at the Institute. Ah, so you're the first year going through? Yeah. All right. And that would, would have been then a three year, so it was still a diploma or it became a degree? It's a three year and three month sort of transition. It was only two years later they made it a master's degree, oh, sorry, a bachelor degree over the full four, four oh. years, but we did, we did a diploma. 
Yeah. And when you finished, like, what do you remember about becoming a physio? Was it the paycheck or was it the status and having graduating? Like, was it, in the, what, what, what was it for you that was like, wow, now I'm a physio? Um, it's an interesting question. And um, when I thought about it, it had nothing to do with the paycheck. I have no idea why. I have no recollection of getting my first paycheck. The thing that hits me most was that when I, my second to last roster was at the children's hospital and I was always going to be a paediatric physio. Once I decided I liked physio, that's where I was going. But the last, um, the last roster was down at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which at the time was a really progressive, um, challenging place. And they treated students as adults, whereas at a lot of the other placements, we were treated a little bit like we were still at school. And they challenged us. Uh, I think Pat talked talk to you about Dr. Bunt Bunnell, who was a rehabilitation medicine specialist. And he really pushed the physios in his department to challenge the medical diagnosis, to think for ourselves, not just to treat on recipe. And it, it looked like a really exciting place to work. And so I decided that that's where I would, I would like to go and never truly got back to the pediatrics. But um, um, that, you know, it was, it was just before we had right of private practice, uh, sorry, right of independent practice without referral. And Bunt was very much pushing us to think that way, which mm. did cause a few headaches with my father for a while because he had the consideration that he was trained to diagnose, I was trained to treat. So we, we had a few arguments, but I won him over in the end. After Interesting dinner it. conversations, were they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think, you know, that would be a whole interesting area to explore. Like, and Pat, Pat had mentioned it too around, you know, this transition 76, 77 to first contact or primary contact practitioners. Mm. Um, I found it very interesting that it was only in New South Wales where they had, they couldn't legally treat without a referral, whereas all the other states just assumed they couldn't do it. But in fact, they had had no requirement to be referred by a medical practitioner. Yeah, when I heard you say that in one of your podcasts, I was surprised too because I hadn't realised that either. Yeah. It was they made a deal of it when it when it was rescinded. But I guess, well, I was only young, but I guess I just assumed that 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 was what the case, what the situation mm. was. So, how did your career develop in those first couple of years once you had graduated from your undergraduate degree? Um, I worked for just a little bit less than a year at the Queen Elizabeth and then got married and my then husband moved to Canberra for a job in the um, public service. So I went to work at Wadenvalley Hospital, which is now the Canberra Hospital. Uh, at the time, Woden Valley was a very new hospital and I thought, well, this is going to be exciting. It's a new hospital. It'll be a bit like working at the Queen Liz. It'll be all full of really exciting things and a new modern department and all the rest of it. And it absolutely was not. Yes, it was a new modern department, but as a place to work for a new grad who had come out of a program as biased by manual therapy and people like Jeff Maitland and Pat Trott, to somewhere where the majority of the people were trained elsewhere, the very, very different philosophy. I absolutely hated it. Mm. I, nobody would help me um, to deal with patients I couldn't sort out for myself. I'm not sure whether they didn't know how to or whether it was just because the way I went about it was different to what they knew. But the standard process in outpatients was we had a one room, small room with five shortwave diathermy machines in it. And you would book a short wave diathermy machine and you would put the short wave on whichever body part the patient came in with that was a problem. Yeah. That was the expectation. I couldn't handle that. I just could not handle it at all. So I hated it and got desperately, desperately homesick physio-wise. Mm. Um, was, I just felt I, I just I needed to be back in that environment or I felt I needed to be back in that environment of the sort of assess, reassess, critical thinking that had been ingrained in us right from the beginning because of Jeff and Pat's influence in the physio school all the way through. I think that's, that's a key point just to point out how different the, I guess the practice of physiotherapy was being performed at that stage around Australia. Like there were very much pockets 
of higher re- higher clinical reasoning, test, retest, um, as opposed to, and I can remember even going on a clinical prac down here at Fremont Hospital and in the outpatient, it was like six, six curtain off bedroom, bed, so to speak. But in about mm-hmm. three of them, they're all just full of shortwave diathermy machines and you'd wheel them out. And there was like only two or three beds for treatment because there was so much electro equipment. Mm. And then you go to a private practice for a clinic and there'd be no shortwave diathermy and there'd be a completely different, almost, you know, a Maitland based approach on how you would assess and then reassess and the clinical reasoning was an important part. So it, it was very much a transition period, I'm guessing, in the sort of the, the late seventies and the early eighties until more of this emanated throughout the whole of the physio programs. Yeah. And to be fair, I don't want to be disrespectful to those colleagues from Wadden Valley at the time. There was a lot of physio that they had been taught <clears throat> that was very different to what we had and was a lot more advanced than we had in other areas. Yeah. But I spent most of my time in, in outpants uh, or in the pool. So, um, uh, I didn't get exposed to a lot of that, but there were definitely areas that they were way better than I was. Yeah, I just no, and that's fine. I think it's just, as you say, in your area of interest, it wasn't a, a blossoming thing at that point in time. So you mentioned you became homesick for physio. Is that when you came up, came back to South Australia and did post-grad? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I was still getting the newsletters from the South Australian branch of the APA and I saw the advertisement for the graduate diploma and applied. I can't even remember whether I asked my husband if I could, I think I just did it. I wasn't expecting to get in because I didn't have the full two years of experience. So when when it came back that I had got in, um, I can remember opening the letter and sitting on the doorstop and bawling my eyes out, I was so excited. Um, So yeah, we came back at that point, he transferred to the equivalent position here. And um, I got on with, with the, what was then a graduate diploma, not a master's. And this you accepted into at the time, was it the APA three month program or was it the new 12 month program? It was the new 12 month program. I, um, Pat and a couple of others did the first year of that. And I was part of the second year. So we had the first three months, we worked on peripheral techniques and peripheral patients, patients with peripheral problems. We learned every single technique from Jeff by him teaching it, by doing it on each of us and then us repeating it on him. And we wouldn't, he wouldn't let us move on to the next technique until he was satisfied that we could do it properly. And it's an extraordinary way to learn manual handling skills from somebody like him. Yeah. So that was the first three months. All the patients we saw had peripheral problems or was supposed to have peripheral problems. And then the second three months, we joined in with the APA spinal manipulation course. And at that point, 12 of 12 others from that group joined us for that three months. Yeah. And obviously the, the clinical tutor ratio expanded from just Jeff to, because uh, there were only three of us, out to there were 15 of us. So there were five tutors. Um, and um then we went back in the last three months to just Jeff and they did send down Claire Everson, who was a, um, a, a PNF expert to work with us at the Queen. We, the roster was down at the Queen Elizabeth again, thinking that maybe they should keep us not too focused on manual therapy, but she abandoned us after three weeks, said our handling for PNF was so hopeless. It was what she, we were just wasting her time. So, so hopeless. So <laughs> hopeless. Yes. <laughs> okay, so being a student of both Jeff and Pat during that 12 month period, how would you say they were different as tutors? Oh, they were very different as tutors. The other thing I'd say is that in that three month course, we were also tutored by Brian Edwards. Oh, okay. So we were incredibly lucky that Brian had been on study leave and he'd gone off to Norway to work with Freddie Cartenborn had a, I gather, a humdinger argument with Freddie because they didn't see eye to eye about how they went about things, came back to Australia and was at a loose end. So Jeff snapped him up to teach on the three month course. So we had Jeff, Pat and Brian and um, two other two others, I think, who were graduates of the three month course. Um, but 
So there were five tutors. So yes, that's right. And the three of them were very different. Jeff, I mean, the, the way to probably explain that best, um, Brian was very much more biomechanically oriented uh, because you've got a much stronger biomechanical background in yeah. Perth than we ever had. Um, Jeff was much more symptom focused, signs and symptoms, listening to the patient, uh, establishing the patient's story and that reasoning approach. Pat was more diagnostically oriented. She would still, she, she was obviously very much in the same line as, as Jeff, but um, for example, we all knew that if we had Brian in an exam, we needed to do PIVMs for our clinical stuff. For Jeff, it was PIVMs. For Pat, she would ask you at the end, well, what do you think the diagnosis is? And um, which the other two didn't at all. So Pat was, was a bit more black and white, straight up and down. No, and that's not being disrespectful. She was just that little oh, bit different. different. And, um, but uh, yeah, there was some interesting differences between the, the three of them. Yeah. And Brian, Brian came out in the middle of one of our sessions and, and saying in really, I think Brian would be the only person who could say it even back then, that he felt there was no place for women in manual therapy. <laughs> or in tiger moths either probably. Probably not. No, he asked if he'd take me up in it one day and he said no. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of concepts do you think of Jeff's are uh, just as relevant today as perhaps they were when you first learnt them? Uh, well, you listen to some of the people who have swung the pendulum a very long way in the opposite direction. And they would say that it, almost anything that Jeff came out with was bullshit. And that makes me really sad because I think the profession is doing itself a disservice if we swing that pendulum too far because there are so many things that are just as relevant now as were back then. One of them is the clinical reasoning, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the concept of reasoning that, well, he never called it clinical reasoning, that wasn't his term, but that listen, assess, try something, reassess it, work out what, what that means, approach it differently afterwards. That to me is absolutely fundamental to physiotherapy and he was a real trailblazer in that regard. The two other things that as obviously I have a bias towards manual therapy, it's not everything I do, but um, having had a lot of time being taught by those two, it is a big part of what I do. One of them is, is that I don't feel that manual therapy is taught well enough, I think one of the reasons why people have been very disparaging about manual therapy and why some of the research doesn't demonstrate good results with manual therapy is that people aren't taught to do it well anymore. And that's because one of the fundamental principles of using manual therapy, if we can just stay in that, that um, uh, parameter at the moment, is knowing when to use what type of movement mm. in what's, what context of how the patient's presented. So that the whole idea of movement diagrams, which people poo poo because they can't be validated and because they vary and you know you move somebody's joint and I move somebody's joint, they're gonna be different because you've changed them. But it's that fundamental principle of being aware of what it is that is restricting movement. And then using that, if you are going to choose to use manual therapy as your treatment, using those principles is the way to guide how you use your manual therapy. So if something is very painful and the restriction is very much muscle guarding related, then you're going to use a different approach to treating that than to somebody who, when you do your manual therapy, they feel stiff as a ball. Mm. Um, where if you do nice gentle techniques on that patient, you're wasting the time. If you try to push hard on the first patient, they're going to walk out the door and never come back. So to me, that's that the concept of, and what a movement diagram is, for those who've never heard of it, is essentially just bringing to a conscious level, making you deliberately think what it is that you're feeling through your hands and then making decisions on the basis of what you feel. The diagram is just a way of trying to, to visualise that and communicate it with somebody else. It was never intended as a research tool, which people have tried to make it. It was always just a means to an end to teach you how to feel, but a really valuable one. Mm. Um, from that perspective. The other thing that I think of, of Jeff's that given that he came out with this concept in the 
1950s. Now, I wasn't there, okay? I wasn't there in the 1950s, neither was Pat, but um, it, it, it was time when we were very much dominated as a profession by being required to be prescriptive from the orthopedic surgeons in particular. And yet Jeff came up with this idea that I think was pretty far-sighted. And this was the brick wall concept. Have you ever heard of that? Doug, or are you too young no, for the brick no, wall? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. Well, it's a bit hard to do it without drawing it. But if you imagine that you have a brick wall and on one side of the brick wall, you have your patient and you've gone through an assessment with that patient and somebody else is listening at the same time. So you've listened to their story, you've done your, your examination, you've done whatever you do for treatment. And then you can come out, you and your colleague come out of that room and you can stand around outside. It's what you do with students all the time and discuss what you got out of that, uh, that encounter. And the other person can say, well, no, I disagree with you about that. I don't think your, I think your interpretation of what that story, that um, set of signs and symptoms means is quite different. And what Jeff would say was that what we did with the patient was the safe side of the brick wall because nobody could contest it. You and I saw the same things. We saw the fact and listened to the same story and saw the same outcome of what we did. What is different was when you come out the other side of the brick wall, if you like, out of the room and talk about it, is our interpretation is different. And you might be right and I might be wrong or the other way around or both of us might be wrong. That doesn't matter. That's all based on what we know now. It, uh, it's not necessarily based on patient signs and symptoms. But what we can't argue about is the patient signs and symptoms. So if I use frozen shoulder or cervical nerve root as one very easy example, you get somebody come, you see somebody coming in with severe pain that radiating down their arm They've got virtually no movement of the arm. It's keeping them awake at night. It's really terrible. Along with that, they may have some restriction of neck movement. You've listened to that story and you've come out and thought this sounds and looks and feels like a frozen shoulder to me. And I might say, no, that seems like a C4 nerve root to me. And we can argue about that all day, but it doesn't, and it doesn't change what the patient presented with. The issue is that if I, um, Oh, it's sort of mixing, it's not quite right. But if, if I say it's a frozen shoulder and we treat all frozen shoulders the same, then we're going to be helpful for the one um, that's acute if we use one approach to it. But if we treat the stiff, grotty, end-stage frozen shoulder the same way as you treat that acute one or vice versa, you're not going to be effective. And it's the big thing was that we were, the two of us or the people who come out of that room and argue or discuss what's going on, what they think is, is happening and what might be an appropriate approach to the treatment. Be, uh, working on what we know now, but also he would talk about that brick wall being permeable because research will inform us over time so that we know now more about how to treat things than we knew back when he did that 50 years ago. Mm. And tendon stuff is an absolute classic. Yeah, but, you know, We've known about tendon for a long time, but we now have directed ways of treating them that we never had in the past. And that's because the research has, has given us opportunities to make that direct link. Yeah, definitely. So it stops you being recipe-based. It, it stops you being um, um, sort of, it, it opens your mind to what the patient is telling you and what you are observing rather than thinking purely diagnostically. Yeah. Does that I describe that well enough? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Well, I've, ne I've not heard the concept, which is kind of interesting in a way, but I understand what you're saying is that the signs and symptoms as recorded by the patient are the absolute truth because that's what the source of information is. And then the two clinicians that are listening to it, they are basically filtering it from their experience, understanding and knowledge. And then when they have a yes. conversation, that's when the interpretation is different. But the actual source of this, the source of the knowledge is the same. And I think that's yeah. where education can come into play. Like the two clinicians need to talk together and say, well, the, and this is again, clinical reasoning because I heard this, this, and this, yeah. and this, it points me in this direction. And you yeah. heard that and that and that. And I know I would be again, having a new physio in our clinic in the last couple of weeks, it's made me realize how much of an emphasis I have diving into their sleep profile, their sleep pattern, their quality of sleep. That's just something I have a strong interest in. And 
I can see in talking to this new physio, it's just not on their radar whatsoever. Yeah. And yet yeah. for me, it probably informs, I don't know, 40 or 50% of my clinical practice, how I would manage patients. And it didn't 10 years ago. So as yeah, I can see what you're saying, that as we develop more understanding and awareness and knowledge, it changes the way, and I, I just think it as filtering, it just filters how we see information and how important it is to us. And another person mm -hmm. might hear something and they'll completely discard it, but I would jump on that and say, hang on, that's critical information they've just given us because of my past experience. So I think, is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah, more or less. It was probably back then a little bit simpler, but the principle is exactly the same. Oh, and I think we've got to take hats off to Jeff too, because it's, it's, as you say, tenon, it's easy to say that now, but you know, 60 years ago, this was a radical idea. So it's always trying yeah. to be important to put it into context as well. And he was operating by himself largely, whereas we have a whole field of professional physios that have got a wealth of knowledge and research, and we have a flexibility and permeability of knowledge now as bit back then, he would have been really working on this pretty hard himself. So given the yeah, precise, and... sorry. Sorry, go on. No, no. I was just going to say that the focus very much was on diagnosis and because of who he was, he was working predominantly with the orthopedic surgeons yeah. and neurosurgeons, but neurosurgeons didn't do the fancy stuff they do these days. Yeah. So given the precise and I guess very exacting nature of Jeff and also Pat in their questioning as instructors, how did that shape the way you became as a clinician, do you think? Yes, it definitely did. I, because they were such a big part of who I was taught by, I really don't think there was anybody much else who influenced influenced me. I mean, they were, Jeff, Pat was my very first clinical tutor in second year. Um, um, Jeff and Pat taught me in the Manips roster in third year. We had both of them, but Jeff more than Pat in our postgrad year. And then I taught alongside both of them, Jeff probably more than Pat initially. Jeff for 10 years and then Pat overall for 25 years. So there really wasn't anybody else much who, who mm. did influence me yeah. in those days. And once you'd finished this postgrad program, did you go on into clinical practice then or did you actually stay on and become part of the teaching staff? I did both. I started working in a, a practice part and, and teaching half so half and half um and that went on for several years and then um i was struggling with running a private practice being a primary primary wage earner having a child and working in the school and so swapped over and from then on was predominantly in the school but always doing clinical supervision with the students and bits and pieces of private practice at the same time here and there Right. Always, you know, it was a mixed role, clinical and teaching in the school. Yeah. So how long were you then at, I guess this is now UniSA, how long were you there yeah. for and when did you finish up? Um, I was officially there for 37 years though, and um, wow. I took the early retirement package. That's starting from that very first, you know, when it was still the Institute of Technology. Um, finished officially to retirement package in 2014 but I'm an adjunct so I still do teaching on a um, sort of on and off basis and that's a way of being able to maintain access to the library which is is the main reason why I would do it plus I enjoy the teaching I enjoy the contact with the students so yeah and this would be teaching on the master's probe in, in musculoskeletal yeah. physiotherapy yeah musculoskeletal and sport They've combined the two now, have they? Well, no, we combined them in 2003, I think it was. And since 2013, uh, 2015, they've separated them out again so that um, you can do a master of one or the other or a combined lot similar to what you can do through UQ. Yeah, okay. So you have to do an extra semester if you want to do the second one. Right. So we've talked about your MANIPS career. I mean, which that also, we should say, culminated in you completing your specialisation in 2008. But you've kind of become renowned about the area of the shoulder complex. So how did your interest in sports physiotherapy develop? Well, the interest in, I'll come back to the interest in the shoulder um, because that wasn't always 
sport related. It, it, I guess the reason I got into the research was, but um, the sports physio, I was an athlete myself. I was a reasonably high level squash player and hockey player. Um, so I had, a, I had a real interest in sport in general. Uh, there really wasn't any formal or, or really much of a push in sports physiotherapy in South Australia at the time. There were a couple of really good sports physios, Max Fitzner being one of them who worked with the cricket and, and um, oh, well, whatever football team was around at the time. Um, I can't quite remember who, nor would I think he probably worked with, but he might shoot me down in flames. Um, but there wasn't a lot of, of sports physio as such like it was in the Eastern States in particular. Um, and we, they set up a master's program through UniSA that didn't really go anywhere. And so in, I had thought my opportunity to become a sports physio had kind of passed me by because of family and financial circumstances and various things. So, um, but Pat, who was head of school at the time in 1995 asked me if I would take over or basically start again and de develop a sports program um, to run alongside the what was then still the manipulative therapy program, manipulative physiotherapy program. And so I had a year to establish that program and I did as much as I could learning from as many people as I could about how to do that. Thinking then, as I still believe that you, if to be a good sports physio, you need to have good hands. And the best way to learn to have good hands was to do the first semester um, from the, the MANIPS program. And then we branched out and did two separate things, which later on got combined so that, because all the sports students looked at what the MANIPS guys were getting and said, we want that. And the sports, the MANIPS guys said, we want that. So we ended up combining the two programs um, and ran them that way for um, 10 years at least. I think it might have even been longer. Um, so that was, I will forever be grateful to Pat for that opportunity uh, because it did open up the possibility of getting in sports again for me. The other thing that happened at around that time is that my daughter started to show signs of developing into an elite uh, softball player, softball pitcher. And so I started to get involved with working with her state level teams um, as the team physio and um, persuaded the then CEO of Softball Australia when they fit, had a first uh, friendship, junior friendship series in Sydney at the Olympic Park in Blacktown, where they took um, 40 girls and 40 boys, I think it was, can't quite remember, into this camp to give them sort of advanced training and give them the opportunity to play in mixed teams, not mixed as in girls and boys, but teams with people from other states and the like. And I rang him up and somewhat precociously tried, persuaded him that he needed a physiotherapy therapist there because my daughter was going. And um, he didn't think he did at the time. I ended up treating more than 40 kids a day for that 10 days with no equipment, no, just a, you know, a portable bed in a tiny room in the bottom of the, the stadium. It was absolutely freezing and it was the middle of July and, and um, learnt so because I then ended up doing that for the next 14 years. Mm -hmm. And the process that we used obviously developed over time, but it was a fabulous way to learn quick thinking, pattern recognition, um, how to treat people with nothing but your hands and tape and ice. Um, and um, really good way to learn that kind of on the ground sports physio and we actually turned it into um, one of the things that our students had to do in their their practical exams was give them a 10 minute assessment right you've got 10 minutes to make a decision about this situation or that situation and we used to practice them in class as well so that they had to it was all about pattern recognition mm. and um, therefore being able to really target what you were looking for and not panic, um, which is what a lot of the students would do and what I did in that first couple of years. Yeah. And so I you... then went to the Commonwealth Games with, um, in 2006, so that was another highlight. Yeah. So your PhD, though, it was in the shoulder, wasn't it? PhD was in the shoulder, yes, and that stemmed, well, actually... At the time, I was really interested in, in trying to validate the clinical patterns that we worked with 
in different areas. And the two areas I was interested in, one was lumbar spine and the other was the shoulder. And I spoke to my good friend, Gwen Joel, who was on that three month MNIPS course the year I did the 12 month course and then came back the following year. Um, so I rang Gwen and said, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? And she said, well, we've got a whole bunch of people starting to do really exciting work on the lumbar spine. And I'm not aware of anybody doing anything in the shoulder. So why don't you, why don't you go with the shoulder, which suited me fine because I had a real interest in the shoulder. So that was kind of where it started, but it was the, the plan was to work on um, trying to see how accurate we could be with a physiotherapy assessment in terms of what the diagnosis was. Remember, this was when we were still very much mechanistically oriented. Um, but the real interest was to turn that around and say, okay, if you have this set of signs and symptoms that you see clinically, is there any way we can validate those patterns on what is seen arthroscopically? And arthroscopy was still very new for the shoulder at that time. Yeah. So that was the plan. That bit never happened yeah. because unfortunately the statistical power wasn't available. Something would be really easy to do now, but as it turned out back then, it wasn't. So um, the, the um, research became one of um, assessing my ability to diagnose um, against what was found at arthroscopy and comparing my diagnosis from my examination with what the surgeons did. And I was blinded to their, their clinical diagnosis. I didn't know the imaging. I didn't know what they thought. All I knew was that they had considered the patient was suitable for arthroscopy. And were there so things from that research that you think clinicians could take home now? based upon your um, findings? Yes. yes, I do. Um, and even though life has changed in terms of what we now know compared to back then, which goes back to the brick wall a bit, um, the pedantry of a really thorough examination, looking beyond just the obvious area that may you may consider is the source of symptoms, um, looking at the big picture, well, I mean, I did a, an examination of the whole complex. We then realised we could only actually compare against what surgeons were looking at in the, you know, with the arthroscope. But looking beyond, sort of really understanding the biomechanics and the the anatomical structure and therefore the function of all the tissues around there and how they are integrated with the scapula, with the cervical spine, with the um, thoracic spine, and all the associated muscles. Um, as a way of, of looking at people with who are coming in with what sounds like a nociceptive local shoulder problem or, or shoulder as opposed to, sorry, shoulder complex, as opposed to something that's being dominated by, by non-nociceptive um, components. You, if you are prepared to look beyond the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint and the rotator cuff, which seems to be what the, doc the doctors will focus on. Um, there's so much you we have to offer these people. Um, but the patients that often come to me who have seen other physios have been given rotator cuff exercises as rotation against their band with the arm by the side. Have they given you anything else? Did they look at your neck? Did they look at your shoulder blade? Did they do any? No, none of that. And that's, that's really frustrating to me because there is so much we can do for these people. Um, and if you combine your knowledge of pain science and, and the brain's influence on all of this and incorporate that as well, there's, you know, there's an awful lot based on what I learned back then that is really valuable still. Yeah. I think it is, it's probably worth mentioning here that you're coming across to Perth in 2022 to do a course on this specific topic. So for those that are listening that want to get a face-to-face -face, um, injection of energy, understanding and research-based treatment management plans, um, sign up with um, the course that we're organising for 2022 in Perth and it's going to be a chance for people to actually sort of see that in action. I think that's pretty special. So, um, I hope so Doug, because I hope the plan, the plan, as we talked about, was to try to make this case-based. Yes. So that we, we are looking at the reasoning and the, the differences in people who present in different ways rather than it just being, well, here is how you can do it, go away. It's, it's trying to make it relevant to, to so people have got something they can genuinely take back to work on Monday morning. 
Yeah. So in addition to completing your specialization in 2008, you did 2009, you did your sports specialization. Is there plans for a trifecta? Do you want to go for a third one? Uh, no. Pediatrics, perhaps? No, I did. Um, remember, I actually failed my first sports exam. So I had to go back and redo that. That was an incredibly traumatic experience for somebody who was running a sports program to fail that sports exam was fairly humiliating. There was a lot of stuff going on with that exam round that we won't go into, but um, I took a lot to go back and redo it. And when I made that decision, in conjunction with Karen Faulkner, who I hope your listeners will be aware of, if not, you need to interview Karen, Doug. Uh, she is amazing. She's the best student out of our sports program we ever had. Um, so um, Karen was at the time working with the Olympic, uh, at the AIS with, with um, the Olympic gymnastics program. So for them to fail Karen and fail me, among others, was red rag to a ball to me. And the mother hen instinct of looking after your students um, came through and we decided almost at the same moment, having been really disillusioned, that we would go back and do it again. And having made that decision, I did everything I possibly could to reflect on what I could have done better, that maybe was the reason why I had failed, because you didn't get any feedback back then, and um, took that very big breath and sat again. And uh, to me, that's my trifecta. I'm not going back to do anything like that again. Yeah, well, it is. It's a huge thing. It's K2, Everest, then back up to Everest again. And really, it's a the, the specialization is a massive process and it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough gig. And particularly, I had a stumbling block there as well. And I remember thinking, yeah, big breath. Come on, you can do this. It's, you know, you're two thirds of the way there. It's, you just got to push on. And I think there are times. And then, and then you look back on it and you go, well, I'm really glad I did it. You know, I would yeah. hate to have stumbled at that point and always had that thought in my mind, what if, you know, if I hadn't have done it, could I have done it? Was I up to, was I up to the task? And I think, you know, it, it's hard work. So yeah, I guess that's just one of those learning things in life, yeah. isn't it? That's exactly the way I felt. I, when we both Karen and I made the decision, it was exactly that, that we felt we would have failed ourselves if we hadn't gone back and tried again, if mm. we'd tried again and failed again, well, then you've got a, you've got some pretty hard lessons to learn, but yeah. um, it was an enormously empowering thing to do, but an absolutely terrifying thing to do. It is like, I, yeah, all right, we won't go any further. So staying with the specialization <laughs> um, and therefore, so the college of physiotherapists, You've now gone on and become involved, you know, not only as a participant, but as a facilitator and a mentor to participants and, and the chief censor of the college as well. So you've really got in there with gumboots kicking and you've, you know, this the vice you know, president for a while too. Yeah. You know, that, you know, the process now inside out, what's mm -hmm. your current role with the college? My current role is as chair of the credentialing standing committee. We now have a series of standing committees that, um, are, that work underneath the college council and each of the chairs of those standing committees is a member of council. And so that's a process that's been in place for the last two years with the year before that sort of an interim period while we were sorting out exactly what we needed and what, what each of those standing committees would be doing. Um, so credentialing will be uh, responsible for the assessment of candidates or people working towards um, going through the career pathway and then once they apply for uh, entry into the specialisation training program. So that part of what we hasn't actually been um, developed yet because we're waiting for Sean O'Leary's um, standing committee, which is the fellowship program standing committee to finalise the new training program, specialisation training program. So we've been working up to what they're calling milestone three of the career pathway up till now. Yeah. And we have just had a really innovative, far-sighted um, recommendation for an assessment process for up to milestone three that will be able to roll over to milestone four, accepted by College Council literally just three weeks ago. And Richard Newsham West, who's vice chair of the standing committee, who now um, 
is in charge of the the new Latrobe master's programs, which uh, will be substantially revised or are being substantially revised. He chaired the, the working party that put that together and he's very much up with um, modern assessment um, processes. And he had a fantastic group of people on his working party, including your friend Gwen Jo, my friend Gwen Jo. And um, they've come up with a, a fantastic Thing. So that's a that for this year has been what we've been doing predominantly is working through through that assessment process that has just been accepted by the college. So that's that's my role at the moment is chairing that standing committee. Yeah. And where do you see the college going sort of in the next five years? Because obviously this is an important part of our profession and I guess sharpening the, the point of the profession as far as its quality perception within the public and also uh, medical profession in a way, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. Um, this answer is going to have to go a little bit further than just where the college is going, because the college is working uh, very closely with the APA to develop a new career pathway for physios from when they graduate, right up, if they're interested to go that far, all the way up to fellowship. And so the career pathway is, um, it's not actually been totally signed off on yet, if that's correct English, but what we're looking at is that there are four milestones that you have to achieve. There's been a lot of work to develop this career pathway with um, um, the APA um, commissioning work from workforce. I can't remember what their other name is, but it's, it was a combination of Wendy Nixon, um, Megan Dalton and Megan Davidson, who, who developed the career pathway that was based on the CAMMEDS model, which don't ask me to go into, but it's Anyway, so they developed this career pathway that involves four levels, with milestone one being essentially the first thing you would do when you come out of, of physio school. Milestone two is sort of, if you, if you think of it a little bit like level one, level two sports courses, but it's much broader than that, but that gives you that sort of concept. Um, and then milestone three is actually not what we're currently calling titling. It's, it's a higher level than that, but that is all in the process of, of changing. And that's the level where you would be able to apply to come into the fellowship training program. Okay. So that the idea is that we will hopefully capture young physios as they leave, um, as they graduate. And I'm hoping that this concept be embedded into the undergraduate program as well. So that all the way through their training, physios learn like the, med like the medicos do, that you're not going to be able to solve everybody's problem the day you've you graduate from school, you're going to have to go on and do further training, further gain further experience, explore where you want to go with your, your professional interests, and then take a pathway towards that. And that would be the expectation when you leave, um, when you leave, when you graduate. And that's what the career pathway is all about. Uh, with the, the, it looks like where the college is going to go will be that we will be responsible for providing the, the assessment and, and um, requirements for milestone three, which is a level up from what is currently called titling. Titling is kind of halfway there, but not quite. And for the ship training program, so for the, the process to fellowship. Now, in addition to that, the college will be, or already runs the um, fellowship by original contribution. And that process is looking to be changed to become a fellowship by research, which will allow you to be a fellow of the College of Physiotherapists in brackets research, rather than in brackets original contribution. You can't call yourself a specialist because you don't have those special skills, but you are still a fellow and your high level of research skills would be acknowledged in that way. And there are a couple of other pathways that are being developed at the moment. Okay. So that's, that's it in a, Nutshell, if you like. Yeah. Huge and, amount of work gone into developing this, but it's not yes. quite there yet. And do you think that the College of um, Physiotherapists should be dependent or independent of the APA as a body? Um, that's a very fighting question, Doug. The, there have been times when um, the college very much wanted to be separate from the APA. Um, and... Um, I was vice president at the time and Pete Fazy was the president. 
And we, there seemed to be a real stumbling block at the time in relation to communication and cooperation. And that, um, it, it became fairly obvious that there was no way that if the college wanted to do what we wanted to do, we couldn't do it without strong interaction with the APA and without support and funding through the APA. And so um, while they might frustrate us at times and we frustrate them at times, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. We can't function independently at this time. And um, yeah, at the moment, I think things are working fairly well. Though, as I say, there have been some rough times mm. on the way through. So if it's, if it's mainly a funding thing, would that be something that the college would possibly consider in the future when you have more members, um, more membership coming in to have an independent role? So you're not sort of influenced by an external body when you're trying to be independent in say credentialing? Yeah, I don't, I can't predict well into the future, but I don't think so because I think we've worked out and it's been one of the, the things that's been difficult, but we've worked out the way the career pathway will work so that what the APA offers will be predominantly, or the plan is that it will be predominantly focused on milestone one and two and what the college offers, which is the from milestone to up to fellowship for those who want to go that far are very much linked together and lead on one to the one from the other but the will the big the big thing that has changed and will be changing is that there is no recipe to get there you don't have to do for example a sports level one a sports level two before you can move further you might that might be one thing that you use to inform you, but your assessment processes will be very much based on, all the way through, will be based on your interpretation and what you've got out of it and how you've, say, out of your level one or level two sports and how you have then implemented what you've learned in practice, not that you've, you've passed an assessment that says, tick, I've done level one. It's very much more related to integrating what you've learned into your demonstrating that you've integrated what you've learned into your practice. And you can do that across a whole range of different areas, build a portfolio for yourself that, that expresses your interest. And you may decide you want to do sports with a particular interest in um, the example that Richard always uses is women's health. So you might end up having, you know, a combined process a, a portfolio that goes across two disciplines two yes. that we recognize as formal disciplines at this point yeah. and um so there'll be much much more flexibility across the whole career pathway right from when they leave when they graduate right all the way up so that i think it will work much better than it may have done in the past yeah what three it's things sorry go on I just it's taken a lot of work to get there but that's where oh, we're, look we it's, there's a huge amount of creative thought and energy and time from a lot of people that have put this together. And it's, you know, it's like if I did a little radio commercial, it'd be like, congratulations to all those members of the college and all the volunteer hours that they've done, because it is a mammoth effort and, you know, hats you, off, yep. big clap. Thank you very much again, you know, for all the efforts of those people, largely unsung that have, have put into this process. And yeah, look, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's awesome what they have done for us as a professional contribution. Um, well, I three think things. it's a real reflection of how passionate, just to hang on a sec, Doug, I think it's a real reflection of how passionate people are about our profession. And that, you know, to me is, is one of the big stories that we, we should try to get across that we do have a fantastic profession of people who really care about the profession as well as about the patients that they see. Yeah, here, here. Yeah. Hey, Mary, three things in your professional life that have particularly stood out for you, what would they be? Um, this is one where I'm going to remind myself. First one would be having the opportunity to work with people who are as extraordinary as um, Pat and Jeff were pat still is um she's not no longer working as a physio but she is just the same person she always was so that to me is is one very much um oh there are others um another one i guess was a, a particular incident was going up onto the stage to be awarded that fellowship in sports physiotherapy 
knowing that the year before or two years before I'd been up on the stage for the musculoskeletal one and being invited by Pete Fazy to give the, the presentation on behalf of the new fellows. Uh, that was a very emotional and really special moment for me. Um, another one that I would like to think of is, well, it really comes partly from that, is that um, one of the graduates of our master's program, the more recent graduates of our master's program, Harry Trong, um, has just finished the program successfully. He was awarded his fellowship at exams earlier in the year, and I mentored Harry a lot on the way through, not officially, but um, the mother hen comes out in me when it comes to, as I said with Karen, when it comes to our, our graduates. And I was so proud of Harry that he's managed to make that, um, you know, achieve that because he's worked really, really hard to do that, as they all do, of course. And if you will allow me, having listened to you talking to Ebony Rio a couple of days ago, and I know I know Eb's pretty well, not so much recently, but we certainly did a lot together some years ago. Um, her comment about how special it is to see when you've made a difference to somebody's life, you've really turned their, their life around with what you've offered them. And that immediately made me think of one particular patient. Can I tell you the story about him? Sure. This was a guy who was in his well, middle 20s. Um, he was about six foot eight. He was at least 30 kilos overweight when he came in. He was really down and out, really depressed, really at the end of his tether. He came um, on work cover with a shoulder problem. And his story was that he had been working as um, um, in security at one of the big places in town and had had an incident where um, one of the patrons had, he had been having to manhandle her to try to get her out of the building because she was drunk. And she just bent her knees, so dropped her whole weight on him unexpectedly and he subluxed his shoulder and he also hurt his back. Um, and he, his, his issues had gone on from there. So he had massive PTSD related issues associated with this. Um, it didn't seem like anybody had been able to help him. He was seeing a psychiatrist. He was on massive doses of all sorts of horrible drugs that were just making him feel awful. And I'm not quite sure why he ended up with me, but I very quickly realized that, that he was so hypermobile and so deconditioned and so dysfunctional that there was nothing, nothing physical that it's in terms of any sort of hands-on or any kind of subtle exercise that I could give him. So my role ended up being a little bit of that Mother Mary role again, but in a different context, obviously. And we organised for him to come to the clinic regularly because I didn't think he'd do it unless he was being supervised and start with a really, really gentle Pilates type program. And as he got um, better at that, we included a um, sort of exercise physiology fitness program as well as what he was doing with the Pilates. And I was seeing him only every three to four weeks to encourage him through that and report on his progress and talk to him about how he was feeling and, and what was going on with his, his claim and all that kind of stuff and a psychiatrist. And he ended up, so I did, I, I really was fulfilling the role as a specialist and sort of sending him off to other people with the relevant expertise to help him. He ended up losing 17 kilos in three months. He, um, took the payout from the, the, um, his employer rather than doing what the lawyer was encouraging him to do, which was to keep asking for more money. Um, he was off all the drugs from the psychiatrist. He wasn't seeing a psychiatrist anymore at all. And he ended up with a job working as a security officer for one of those mobile people who goes around checking buildings at night. So because he was doing it all at night, he was earning twice as much money. He didn't have any of that baggage and ended up, as there's a whole lot more to the story, but that's that's enough. Ended up mm. as a, a really positive functioning individual out in the world. And because he was so down out when we started, that was a, you know, he's one that is an exemplar for those patients that give you that real thrill. Yeah, you've really helped them turn around their life and you can see the outcome of that being very positive. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. Hey, if you could step back to your younger self, are there three bits of advice that you'd like to pass on? Yes, 
there are, and I would again struggle with making them only three, sorry. Um, but the big one is, um, well, the very first thing that I had written down when you, you asked me this question in preparation is ex almost exactly word for word what Ebony said to you about um, if you don't like your first job, don't give up the career, give up the job, look for something else. There is so much within physiotherapy, such breadth of opportunities within physiotherapy that um, if your first job isn't right, it's not the profession, it's the the person in the job, the person giving you the job. So the, the young physios who go straight out into private practice and happen to end up in a practice where they're not being looked after as well as they should be, they're given short appointments to deal with patients in a back room with no PD and then expected to go out and work for sports teams after, after hours at no extra pay. They're the ones that seem to burn out and I can completely understand why. My advice to them is, Get out of that practice. Do your home, do your homework first, maybe, and work out where else you might want to be. Whether it's a different practice, whether it's a different area of physiotherapy, whatever it is. Oops, sorry about the dog. Um, don't um, give up on our profession because it is it just is such a good profession. You left school as one of the brightest leaving school to get into physio. Use that that intelligence to get you where you need to go. And as we talked about earlier, medicine isn't necessarily better than physio. I think our way of thinking is so much more stimulating than what we see in a lot of the medicos, which is being, my father will probably shoot me, but that's okay, he's not here to do that. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one. Um, the second one that I would say is, you don't become a physio to become financially rich. You become a physio because you really care about other people and when things are becoming disillusioning don't forget that it's that passion for looking for working with people for helping them for helping them achieve their goal that is what you became a physio for or what what i would think you become a physio for and i guess one of the others is that that mentoring um finding yourself a good mentor he might be somewhere close to you in age or in experience like Ebony suggested the other night, or it may be somebody who's been around longer than that, or it might be both, but finding yourself a mentor who can help you on the way through, help you decide where you want to go with your career and help you out all the way through. Patrick is my mentor ever, ever since I graduated effectively, and you could not, she could not have had a stronger influence on not just my physio, but on all aspects of my life. She has been fantastic. Mm. So there you go. That's three. I'll leave it at that. That's awesome. Hey, and um, looking forward, like you've got an intimate knowledge of the profession, both clinically, research, the college, uh, university. Where do you see our profession in your eyes going in the next five years? Um. The first of your podcasts that I listened to was the one you did with Toby Hall. And I was really quite surprised and saddened by his answer to that question because he seemed pretty negative and pretty disillusioned by where physiotherapy is going. And I think that's really sad when you look at someone like Toby, he's made such a fantastic contribution to our, our profession. And I'm hoping that he's wrong. And I believe he's wrong because I think there are some people out there who are being very destructive of physiotherapy in some ways, but I don't, I feel really strongly that that's not the case in Australia. I think we are a bit special, that our physiotherapy education is extraordinarily good. And we've matured as a profession a lot in the last um, 20 years. Okay, I'm gonna be biased because I've been very invested in developing the career pathway and working to educate physios in a postgraduate area all my professional life. But the passion that I see in the people coming through the training program for the college that I see coming through the master's programs is such that it really convinces me we've got a very strong future and a future that we're, we're privileged that we are a long way ahead of physiotherapy and other places in the world in that we have been independent practitioners for a very long time. We have good status within the medical area that will only get more as we get more specialists and more people going through the training program. And I think that that uh, we've got a really strong future and people like you who are doing things like this are only going to make that even better. Well, I'm just telling the story of people that have done the work. And I think 
that's that's part of the passion for me is I think there are so many unsung heroes out there that um, shine a beacon forward for a lot of us that perhaps don't know what is being done in the background. So if I can pay, play a small role in you know educating other physios about what has been done on their behalf by these hardworking people, well then that that's that's great. I'm more than happy to do that. So Mary, I'd you know like to. I've said this quite a few times actually. I realise at the end of podcasts when I've listened to people's stories that you know you've contributed hugely to our profession in so many different ways. And I guess that you know in respect of that, I'd like to say personally and professionally thank you very much for your contribution to our profession and also for taking the time to share your journey with us and the listeners on Physio Plus 10. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Doug. I, I appreciate you having invited me and I wouldn't um, belittle your contribution in any way. Thank you. Very sweet. Thanks, Mary. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Physio Plus 10, in which I trust you gain some valuable insights. It'd be awesome if you could leave your two cents worth as a review or rating of this podcast and I look forward to sharing the story of another trailblazing physiotherapist with you in two weeks' time. Stay safe. Bye for now.